The icy splashes stung her face, depriving her of breath. Her frozen hands began to turn blue. The sheer cliffs in the darkness looked like giant palms of a titan, wanting to crush her. But there was no stopping. They were unlikely to leave her alive. Excuse me. Are you listening to me? The patient interrupted her thoughts. Yes, of course, Brenda replied, adjusting her glasses and trying to maintain a composed expression. Voice. Throughout her career, she had heard hundreds of different voices, male and female, rough, squeaky, childlike. Brenda always listened to them very carefully because she needed to understand the client's state. And this was necessary to establish the right communication with them. But this time, Keith Bates's voice affected her in a way that even slightly threw her off. That's all I wanted to tell you. The man shifted in his chair, threw her a quick, puzzled glance. Everything important. Do you think this could have caused my panic attacks? Or do I need to tell you something else? What an amazing voice he had. Not just a velvety baritone. No, there were confidential tones, some purring in the pauses. It seemed like you were talking to the most humane of people. Why did these memories rush back into her life as soon as he uttered the first sentence? Damn it. Of course, this is just the initial stage. Brenda nodded, making incredible efforts to pull herself together. You see, during our therapy sessions, I will ask you many more questions. But I must warn you, they may seem strange and even unexpected to you. However, Every word you say will carry a certain meaning. Moreover, each word is a small step towards improving your condition. Well, that's encouraging. The man smiled, clapping his hands on his knees. Okay, I understand. My time is up. Yes, that's all for today. You can pay for one session or the entire course at once. Whichever is convenient for you, she replied. Smiling, why did she want this Keith Bates to leave as soon as possible right now? Yes, this sometimes happened to her, especially when working in the hospital. There were times when she couldn't establish a connection with a patient, especially from the first few minutes. But if she didn't have a choice before, now she could refuse to work with the client without explaining any reasons. And this clause was written in the contract. However, Brenda now understood that despite all this strange dislike for Keith, she had to continue. But what had made her so wary, seemingly a quite standard situation. Panic attacks. Everyone seems to have them these days. Over her many years of practice, Brenda had developed a range of effective methods capable of efficiently resolving this issue. Nonetheless, she felt that Keith was lying. She couldn't understand why she felt that way. But the thought nagged at her. Brenda replayed the conversation with the man, reviewing her notes in her notebook. Perhaps there was some offhand phrase or gesture that could have triggered unpleasant thoughts for her. Brenda switched on the kettle, dropped a tea bag into a ceramic mug, and filled it with boiling water. The room instantly filled with a delicate, soothing aroma. Brenda loved her cozy office. The heavy blue curtains on the windows, the desk adorned with intricate carvings, the antique wardrobe, the couch for patients, two armchairs, and the bright asters in the vase. She had always been a proponent of functionality, dreaming of a space where every patient would feel comfortable, a place where they could let down their guard and remove their mask. A few years ago, she rented this tiny office with a small hallway and a panoramic window in the old part of the city and bought used furniture. She sewed the curtains herself, planted a ficus with wide glossy leaves, and hung a painting on the wall, painted by her daughter Isabella. Work was steady, there were many clients, but vanity and the desire to boast of her successes were alien to her. Brenda loved coming to her office long before the start of her appointments, and at the end of the workday, she often lingered, sitting in silence, pondering about those who had brought their pains and worries into this cozy space today. The workday came to an end. Today, she particularly wanted to be alone. Brenda looked out the window intently. It was such a grey day, and the whole summer had been dull. A knock on the door interrupted her thoughts. Come in. 
Brenda glanced at the clock. Who could need her at such a late hour? The door creaked open. Keith peeked into the office again. Sorry, Brenda. I left my planner with you. He said apologetically, looking around. Ah, there it is. I thought you had left so long ago. The woman exclaimed. Yes, indeed. I wanted to stop by a cafe. Wait out the rain. Turns out it was closed. Then I went outside and there was heavy rain. It's a good thing you are still here. Although I'm by car, the parking is far, and I'll get soaked by the time I reach it. You're right about that, Brenda said. There's no parking near the building. It's a park. Many clients complain. By the way, where in your city can you get a good coffee? His brown eyes took on a warm golden hue. Maybe you'll join me, and you can also show me the most wonderful place in your city. Keith said, noticeably embarrassed, the most wonderful place. A phrase from another era. Or was it another hook this strange stranger was trying to catch her with? Well, consider me taking your bait, Brenda thought. Why not? She smiled. I'll close up now and come down to you. Keith left the office. Brenda shut down her laptop. Her gaze fell upon a bright glossy square photo on the desk. How did it get here? It must have fallen out of a book. Brenda scrutinized herself in it intensely. Photographs, anchors of the past. She looked so grown up here. The glasses slightly askew on her nose. The red hair, the barely noticeable freckles. She had a sturdy, slender figure. Big eyes. And a straight, slightly upturned nose. The memories were so close. You could almost reach out and touch them. You brush them with the tips of your fingers, or the very edge of consciousness, and they come to life like phantoms. For a while, they settle inside you, and suddenly it seemed like she was left alone with her life, with her banished memories. Her heart ached. Breathing became difficult. It all seemed like it was just the other day. A young girl, almost graduating from school, grand plans for life in her head. Sitting at her beloved piano, Brenda couldn't even imagine the winding road fate had prepared for her. The chromatic scale always set the tone for her practice. Brenda preferred to start with it. First, gently touch each key with her fingers, as if greeting the instrument. Then, with each new turn, she would play more intensely, increasing the speed, demonstrating her power over these glossy rectangles. And finally, she would speed up to the limit of her abilities, until her joints cramped. Brenda always made a wish. If she could play the chromatic scale without any hitches, then everything would work out. She executed it flawlessly, and she already anticipated playing all evening. She would play Chopin, and then, if there was time left, she would continue learning ABBA. Deviating from the classical repertoire wasn't encouraged in music school, so Brenda had to tackle it in her free time. As soon as she got her hands on the printed music for the popular composition of that time, she tried to use every spare minute to learn it. The winner takes it all. Amazing transitions, profound meaning. This kind of music inspired Brenda more than Chopin. There's noise from the piano echoing through the whole building. Came her stepfather's voice from the hallway, and Brenda instantly recoiled inside. Stephen didn't like music. Well, to be more precise, he probably felt neutral about the piano. The man simply didn't like Brenda, but he couldn't openly express his feelings towards her, so he channeled his aggression towards the piano, which his stepdaughter loved so much. Brenda tried not to play in the presence of this man, but sometimes she was forced to. Like today, she had to demonstrate her readiness for the final exam by tomorrow's lesson, and for that, she needed to practice scales and etudes properly. Why can't you play during the day? How many times do I have to repeat this? He grumbled, entering the room. Stephen was a solid, imposing man, one of those who demanded due respect with every fiber of their being. Every gesture of his was measured, deliberate. His words were weighty and significant. I've been at school during the day, Brenda said, not showing her fear. Susan, Stephen called towards the kitchen. How many times have I told you, 
You should finish all your chores before I get back. I want to come home and relax. Not listen to the sounds of your daughter's piano pounding in my head. Brenda's mom rushed out of the kitchen, wiping her hands with a towel. Why are you home so early today, Stephen? She replied calmly. Brenda hasn't even practiced today, and she needs to prepare. Are you both dumb or what? Can't you figure out such elementary tasks as time management? Stephen said. I manage 2,000 employees, and it's easier to convey requirements to them than to the two of you. I don't seem to be under your manage. Brenda said quietly, not lifting her eyes to Stephen. Stepfather grew even angrier. Why did you speak up, little brat? As long as I'm the one feeding you both, you'll do as I say. Got it, he said. Or maybe your mother will finally start earning something at her institute. Instead of just sitting around, Stefan, what's gotten into you? Brenda's mom tried to defuse the situation, although she knew it was hopeless. I haven't changed. You've driven me to this. How many times have I said there must be silence in the house when I'm around? And when am I supposed to study for the exam? Brenda said again, unable to come to terms with this injustice. I don't care. Stepfather sharply closed the piano lid directly onto Brenda's fingers. The pain was intense. The girl couldn't even scream because her horrid dried throat contracted in spasms. Her mom rushed to her with tears, realizing that something irreversible had happened. What have you done? She sobbed, blowing on her daughter's fingers, now turning purple. She won't be able to play anymore. Why would you do this? Stephen grabbed his wife by the shoulders and shoved her into the corner of the room. What did you call me? Have you forgotten where I pulled you from? You, a divorced woman with baggage. Brenda couldn't move her fingers. The excruciating pain wrapped her arms up to her shoulders. She sat in front of the closed piano, watching her tears drip onto the polished surface of the lid and slowly spread, leaving a murky trail. She was afraid to turn her head. She simply wanted to disappear, dissolve, not hear her stepfather delivering another blow to her mother. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first time this happened. Father behaved the same way when he drank. But after his death, all the negative emotions gradually dissolved in the warm, poignant streams of memories. And the girl began to doubt whether it had really happened or if she had imagined it all in her nightmares. With Stephen, history repeated itself. At first, he was good. So good that their entire family envied them. Oh, how lucky Susan was to have married him. Sober and smart, with a respectable position. Everything was fine, but only for the first few years. One day, Stephen's mask slipped, revealing his true face. It was then that that familiar fear of doing anything wrong in opposition to the man's will crept into their home. The thought of Susan reporting her husband to the police was out of the question. What a shame. She waved off such advice. Stefan is good. He does everything for us, for the family. He doesn't go out, doesn't drink. As long as we don't cross him one too many times. The woman said, Brenda's stepfather never hit her. Not crossing him was the main law she absorbed with every cell, with every breath. And now Brenda dared to disobey it. And for that, she received her punishment. Lying in bed, Brenda listened to the sounds coming from Susan and Stephen's bedroom. Her mother often sobbed. And stepfather, in a gentle voice, said something to her. The words couldn't be heard, but Brenda knew what it was about. He was asking her mother for forgiveness again promising her something. And the next day, she would be preparing breakfast for this man as if nothing had happened, covering her bruises with a thick layer of makeup. Brenda filled her swollen fingers. They seemed intact. Well, whatever, it'll pass. She wasn't ready for the exam anyway. And now she could get a doctor's note and postpone it for a few weeks. In the morning, Brenda tried to get up early while everyone was still asleep. It was dark outside, but she wanted to slip out of the house as soon as possible. She opened the fridge, saw the remains of cake in a transparent plastic box. Oh, how she wanted to eat at least a piece. But if she opened that box, 
the noise would echo throughout the kitchen, and stepfather would surely wake up and start grumbling. She grabbed some change from her jacket pocket and quietly stepped outside. Brenda walked through the damp morning fog on the deserted street. The city was still dark and sleepy. Fallen leaves lay along the curbs. She fell asleep yesterday without dinner. After her mother's argument with her stepfather, she didn't even want to leave her room. Although her stomach cramped with hunger, now her appetite had subsided. But she needed to eat something, anything. Brenda went into the bakery around the corner, counted the coins. Not much, of course, but it was enough for a burger. Besides, the smell of baking could be felt a block away. And Brenda was starting to feel dizzy. The fragrant burger, after hours without food, seemed like a real feast. She ate it in a minute. On Saturdays, instead of regular classes, there were special courses where university professors came to school. Students didn't particularly enjoy these sessions. The material was challenging, and having an extra day off was much preferable to studying sciences. However, Brenda loved attending these classes. She had been diligently preparing for admission to the psychology faculty for a year, so lectures by university professors were valuable to her. The school principal took pride in the established collaboration with universities and always encouraged students who attended these optional lectures. On that day, Associate Professor Henry Hickman from the psychology department was expected. Brenda awaited him with special excitement since she had recently read a monograph by the professor and was impressed. Now she would personally see this scientist and perhaps even get his autograph. For this purpose, Brenda brought along the brochure authored by him. She imagined Henry Hickman as a grey-haired elder, resembling those scientists whose portraits hung in the classroom. However, the associate professor turned out to be an ordinary-looking man in his thirties, quite arrogant, and clearly not very pleased to be delegated to lecture, even in a strong but provincial school. Nevertheless, at the beginning of the class, he uttered several routine phrases about the fantastic initiative of the education department and his personal contribution to the futures of the upcoming graduates. Then the lecture began. Henry spoke like no other teacher could. There was an inexplicable magnetism in his voice, at least for Brenda. The lecture was quite engaging. Although most attendees were clearly struggling with drowsiness, suppressing yawns, Brenda, on the other hand, didn't want to sleep, but she was troubled by heartburn, which grew with each passing minute. The unpleasant bitterness in her throat made her want to cough, and she desperately tried to hold back the urge. And not to interrupt the lecturer, she tried to breathe evenly and swallowed the bitter saliva, which gradually made her feel nauseous. When the bell rang, everyone hurried to leave. Finally, they could go home and enjoy the weekend. Brenda, however, didn't want to go home. But she was also relieved that the lecture was over because she was feeling increasingly queasy. But she had to ask for an autograph. Waiting for all her classmates to leave the classroom, she took the brochure out of her bag and, feeling embarrassed and blushing, approached the desk of the lecturer, who was pocking papers into his leather briefcase. I read your monograph. The girl began, feeling her legs weaken. I would like you to sign it, if possible. Well, Henry grinned widely. I feel like a celebrity. What's your name? I'm Brenda Johnson. I'm planning to apply to the psychology faculty. But here, she replied, well, if you're already studying the subject so deeply, you might as well try applying to us at the main campus. Sure, I'll sign it for you, the lecturer said, reaching for the brochure Brenda was holding. What happened next? She remembered poorly, Henry's hands catching her as she fell, the gray upholstery of the ambulance, faces buzzing around her. Brenda woke up in the hospital ward. The first person she saw was Henry Hickman. He sat at the table next to her bed, writing something intently. There was a cup of tea in front of him, and some papers were spread out. Oh, you're awake. Future psychologist Miss Johnson. He smiled, noticing the girl stir. You really scared everyone. I don't even remember what happened, 
Brenda weakly replied, you fainted. Right in class. They called an ambulance, brought you here, and found out it was poisoning. They pumped your stomach, put you on a drip. Let's skip the rest of the details, Henry said. You ate a burger, right? Yes, a burger. The girl replied, bewildered. There's a joke about burgers and patties, but I won't tell you, Henry smiled. On the other hand, in this mess, all you can do is try to keep your spirits up with humor. You don't have a phone, and there's no one from the school management here. Your classmates scattered. It took two hours to find out your parents' number. Your mom was just reached. She's on her way here. I'll hand you over to her. You didn't have to. Brenda replied to him guiltily. I'm actually legally an adult. Well, it's not written on your face how old you are, Henry retorted. And since I was your teacher this morning, the responsibility falls on me. Thank you so much. Brenda tried to smile. You're welcome, replied the psychology department lecturer. While you were undergoing those procedures and coming to, I was grading my students' papers. So, I didn't waste any time. Brenda's mother rushed into the ward. Ignoring Henry, she rushed to her daughter and hugged her. Henry looked at Susan with some suspicion. There were reasons for that. Most likely, the news that Brenda was in the hospital caught her mother off guard. So she hadn't had time to cover up the bruise under her eye and the cut above her lip. Susan was crying. Brenda understood her mother's tears. They were about everything. Worries from the previous night. Regret about her own failed life. Fear for the future. It all streamed down the woman's cheeks like hot rivulets. Finally, she could cry without worrying that someone might forbid her from doing so. Henry got up from the table, approached Brenda's bed, and touched Susan's shoulder. I'm sorry, the man said. You really shouldn't worry so much. Your daughter is fine. Susan flinched, then looked at the man. Yeah, mom, everything's fine. What's wrong? Brenda added. And this, this is our visiting lecturer from the university, Professor Henry Hickman. He called the ambulance and was with me all this time. Oh, TH, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I got so nervous and they didn't explain anything properly. Brenda's mom stuttered, catching the lecturer's attentive gaze. And then I fell on the stairs yesterday. Susan barely touched the bruise and guiltily lowered her eyes. And this morning, here's another disaster. I understand everything. I wish both of you a speedy recovery. Henry politely replied, packed his papers into his briefcase, bid farewell to Brenda and Susan, and left the room. The days before the exams flew by unnoticed. Brenda diligently prepared for the entrance exams, despite being one of the top students in her class. Ahead was the graduation ceremony. Brenda had to alter her dress several times. From nervousness, she was losing weight visibly. However, the main surprise awaited her at the evening when Henry Hickman appeared in the hall with a huge bouquet of flowers. He came to congratulate one of the best graduates of the school. That was enough for everyone to start gossiping about them. They said that Henry was helping Brenda with her admission. Against this backdrop, the news that Brenda Johnson, one of the best students, hadn't been accepted, came as a real shock to everyone. Brenda lay in her room and listened again to her mother and stepfather arguing. It was one of those fights that definitely wouldn't end in anything serious. As Stephen triumphed, he constantly held up his eldest daughter, Abigail, who got into Harvard and received a scholarship, as an example, and she was supposed to be the benchmark for Brenda. He hinted that Brenda clearly didn't measure up to Abigail's level. Brenda not only didn't get accepted, she completely failed her exams, which only confirmed her stepfather's main argument. His stepdaughter was utterly worthless. She'll now live on our dime, just as foolish as her mother. Let her go work as a cleaner. Snippets of Stephen's cutting remarks reached Brenda's ears, and she barely held back tears. Yes, Stephen was right. She had overestimated herself and her abilities, and she paid the price for her overconfidence. She should have prepared better 
and not worked around with a face as if her place at the faculty was already in the bag. The phone lying next to her pillow vibrated, and Brenda saw a text from Henry. Brenda, can I come get you in an hour? We need to talk about something. It felt like her heart would leap out of her chest. Henry was the only person she felt so calm and secure with lately. Falling asleep, she imagined them strolling and holding hands, how he would take care of her so beautifully. Any thought of Henry invoked a magical flutter in her chest. She immediately replied to his message and went to the bathroom to freshen up. Henry was, as always, impeccable. The car was spotless. He wore a sharp suit with a crisp white shirt, and his hair was neatly combed. Yes, her mom was right. He looked more like a Hollywood actor than a scientist. When Brenda got into the car, he immediately handed her a bouquet of fragrant pale pink peonies. I knew you were feeling really down, and I wanted to cheer you up with something. He said, smiling. I saw there's an ice cream cafe on the way. It seems like it just opened. How about we go there? It was a very expensive cafe with handmade ice cream. A scoop of ice cream cost as much as 10 regular servings in a store. They sat down at a table, ordered servings generously sprinkled with crushed nuts and tiny marshmallows. Brenda had never tasted such delicious treats before. She glanced at Henry. It was time to admit to herself that she liked this man with eyes of such deep blue that they seemed black under electric light. She liked his tousled chestnut hair, his effortless charm, and the familiarity of his intellect. Well, do you feel a bit better now? Henry asked with a smile. Yes, definitely, Brenda replied, licking her spoon. Listen, Brenda, the man began cautiously. I stopped by the dean's office yesterday. He's an old friend of mine, so we looked over your results. It's not entirely legal, so, Please, keep this between us. Of course, naturally, Brenda assured him, her voice tense. So, what's the verdict? Actually, everything was checked correctly, and you didn't make too many mistakes. You just seem to be nervous. But appealing would be entirely pointless. It's just an unnecessary waste of time and nerves, and the result will be the same. He said, how can that be? The girl wondered. I wasn't even that worried. I double-checked several times. Can I know specifically what mistakes I made? No. Like I said, not a word to anyone that I looked at your work, Henry replied. Otherwise, it could cost me my job. And believe me, Brenda, I personally looked through the entire test. All your incorrect answers are indeed incorrect. Or do you doubt my knowledge? No. No. Not at all. Then I don't know what to do next. She replied, lowering her eyes. Listen, the most important thing is not to despair. My advice to you is not to waste time on appeals, trying to figure everything out, and so on. Take a year, relax, and during that time, I'll prepare you. By next spring, you'll be the best. I promise, Henry said lightly touching her shoulder. Why would you want the burden of a failed student? Brenda cautiously asked. Well, I won't hide it. I like you, Henry replied calmly. I understand we have a certain age difference, but I find you intriguing, and I feel really good with you. If you don't feel the same way about me, we will stick to just exam preparation, I promise. But if I can count on even a drop of reciprocity, I'll be the happiest person alive, Brenda. The girl didn't know how to react to Henry's confession. A spark ignited in her heart. Brenda somehow felt it glowing inside her chest, radiating warmth to every corner of her soul. And then everything spun into an incredible whirlwind of dates, works, and late night phone calls. Henry visited her every weekend. These were her first serious relationships. In the middle of summer, the girl decided to introduce Henry to her parents. He came to their house with flowers and gifts, charming Susan during dinner. And how could it be otherwise? He was an educated, charming man with a successful career and achievements in science. Even Brenda's stepfather, Stephen, 
who had made a few sarcastic remarks about the age difference between his stepdaughter and her fiancé the day before the meeting, really liked Henry. Brenda noticed once again how magically Henry affected those around him. It seemed like he said exactly what everyone wanted to hear, and remained silent when necessary. He noticed the best qualities in people, and always emphasized them in conversation. He was an excellent listener and storyteller, captivating everyone with his words. If they get married, we'll have a son-in-law to be proud of. And for your Brenda, such a fiancé is a true gift from fate, Stephen said. Susan blushed. From him, it sounded like a genuine compliment. Susan didn't hide her joy for her daughter. She noted how Brenda lit up and smiled, how she dressed up before each date, and most importantly, she finally emerged from the depressive state she had been in for several weeks after failing her university exams. In the fall, Henry suggested hiring Brenda as a laboratory assistant in his department. This way, she could immerse herself in the university environment, earn some money, and prepare for exams more effectively. He also promised to help with accommodation. Henry himself had a house somewhere outside the city. According to him, it was a whole mansion located in a gated community in a pristine natural area. For convenience, he rented a small apartment in the city, so he suggested Brenderley the move in with him or continue renting a place. She finally relaxed, letting go of the situation. She began reading books, giving her body a chance to just rest especially since the upcoming year promised to be eventful. There was work at the department, preparation for exams at a stronger university, the beginning of her adult life. Brenda pondered all of this with trembling anticipation. They do say, don't they, that often failures open the door to something better. If she had enrolled in the local college, she would have lived with her parents and probably wouldn't have been happy. Plans had to be abruptly reconsidered when in late August Brenda felt unwell for a few days and had pulling pains in her lower abdomen. After which, a pregnancy test showed two clear lines. Brenda was terribly afraid to tell Henry about it, as they had only casually mentioned marriage, as plans for the distant future, and now a child. Contrary to her fears, Henry was immensely delighted with the news. He picked up Brenda, kissed her, began spinning her around the room, and in the evening came with a huge bouquet of roses and a bag of fresh fruits and berries. The next day, Susan and Stephen learned the news. Right during dinner, Henry pulled out a velvet box with a ring and proposed to his beloved. Unexpected events raised Susan's blood pressure, and Stephen even had a brandy. Although he usually didn't drink alcohol. Although, more likely, he was just glad that his stepdaughter would now definitely move in with her future husband. And preferably with her piano. A couple of weeks later, Brenda packed her things and moved into Henry's small apartment. It was bright and cozy. Barely stepping over the threshold of her new home, she realized how easy it was to breathe here. There was no longer the stifling fear that had been restraining her every move. Now she was the mistress of the house. No one would dictate to her what to do, how to speak, or even how to breathe. Unfortunately, there was nowhere to put the piano. But now Brenda could arrange the apartment to her liking and make it cozy. Henry fully agreed to this and allocated a small sum of money for his fiancé to buy various nice things. Stylish satin pillows with embroidery, beautiful curtains, Aromatic candles, all of this Brenda chose with great pleasure. The apartment was being transformed before her eyes. Instead of a dull bachelor pad, it was becoming a warm family nest. Brenda didn't forget about kitchen utensils either. Every day she chose a new recipe and cooked so deliciously for Henry that the man literally ran home in anticipation of dinner. However, the idyll lasted only a few weeks. Brenda started experiencing severe morning sickness. She couldn't eat most of her usual foods and couldn't stand the smells, from her once beloved coffee to her husband's cologne. The only relief from nausea was an unusual drink, cold chicory on orange juice with a few drops of sweet syrup. She read about this strange combination in one of the pregnancy magazines, tried it, and started making it every day. The nausea subsided, 
But one such drink wasn't enough to sustain her, and Brenda still couldn't eat. Despite morning sickness being considered normal, it was decided to consult a doctor. Henry arranged for his beloved to see a doctor at a private clinic owned by his friend. You see, Brenda, the body is an extremely complex system, began the elderly gynecologist. But from the expression on her face, Brenda understood that the situation was much more serious than she had thought. Your symptoms forced you to stay in bed, and that was the best decision. I don't quite understand, murmured Brenda. Tell me, what's happening? Is something wrong with the baby? You have a serious threat of miscarriage. Dear, at an early stage, replied the doctor, adjusting her glasses. As I said, your body compelled you to rest. That's the main recommendation for today's strict bed rest. But, but why could this happen? You see, Brenda, there could be many reasons. It doesn't make sense to investigate them. The doctor replied. The main thing now, I repeat, is complete rest. You only get up to use the bathroom. And of course, medication therapy. Here, I've written a list of medications and their dosages. Keep it. The gynecologist handed Brenda a piece of paper, on which some names were written in illegible handwriting. In two weeks, Brenda, you'll need to get tested again. But for that, I strongly recommend you to call a nurse to come to your home. We offer such a service in our clinic. It's better not to drive, even by car, until we're sure that nothing threatens your future baby. If it's difficult for you to follow all these conditions at home, I'll give you a referral for hospitalization. Brenda wanted to go to the hospital least of all, so she assured the doctor that she would follow all the recommendations at home. Brenda left the office and, almost in tears, told Henry everything. He was so worried that he even offered to carry her to the car. What? I feel fine. I can work. Brenda objected. I know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Henry insisted. Any sudden movement could trigger a miscarriage. So, I'll carefully take you home now, and you'll get into bed. Now, in addition to feeling unwell, Brenda also worried about the baby. At home, she got into bed took out thick pregnancy books from the bookshelf and immersed herself in reading. In the evening, Henry brought pizza from the nearby cafe, along with fresh vegetables. I don't know how to cook, said the man apologetically, sitting on the edge of the bed. While I lived alone, I ate sandwiches and semi-finished products and had lunch and dinner at the university canteen, where, by the way, they serve very tasty food. Although, no, wait, I can fry eggs. Want some? Oh, no, don't even mention fried eggs to me, grimaced Brenda. Well, how about pizza? Shall I put a slice for you while it's still hot? I'll try. My stomach is rumbling, but I have no appetite. Please, just remove all the toppings from it. I'll only eat the dough, Brenda requested. Henry gave her a strange look and left the room. A couple of minutes later, he returned with a plate containing a slice of pizza without any toppings. Well, you can't live on this diet, he said with a gentle reprimand. And such inadequate nutrition isn't beneficial for the baby either. But it's temporary. Brenda tried to reassure him. Darling, as soon as the threat of miscarriage disappears and the morning sickness fades away, I'll lead a normal life. Study, work at your department take care of the house. The doctor said everything should normalize by the second trimester of pregnancy, but there's almost a month unto the second trimester. The man objected. You have to spend this month in bed. You know, I was thinking. Taking Brenda's hand, Henry continued. Since things have turned out this way, we could just get married and have the wedding later when you're feeling better. What do you say? Ha, huh. I don't care about a marriage certificate at all. Brenda shrugged, but I do care about the certificate and the family. Ha ha, he laughed. Yes, that's how old fashioned I am. As my grandmother used to say, a dying breed of men. So let's get married as soon as possible and there won't be any questions after the baby is born. Well, okay, am I against it? 
especially now are indefinitely not up for a wedding. Darling, Brenda replied, gently stroking Henry's hand. Thank you, darling. No one has cared for me and worried about me like this for a long time. Wait, this is just the beginning. The man said with a smile. Did you think my care would be limited to just registering our marriage? And what else? Just please, don't make fried eggs. You're thinking in the right direction. Since I'm at work all day, and you need to lie down, I've decided to arrange help for you. My sister, Jean, will be coming soon. You have a sister? Brenda was surprised. Yeah, a distant sister. Henry hesitated. She's much older than me, currently living in a small town nearby, the one I told you about. I can't wait for us to go there together because there's no more beautiful place on the planet. Believe me, Henry rarely spoke about his family. His mother passed away many years ago due to a severe hereditary illness. His father died a few years later from a heart attack. This topic was extremely painful for him. His distant relatives lived in that town, but Henry didn't talk much about them either. That's why the news of his sister's arrival and her willingness to help future sister-in-law came as a surprise to Brenda. Jean arrived three days later. Brenda was actually glad to see her. Henry left early in the morning and returned in the evening, exhausted. He quickly prepared simple dinners from convenience foods. Dust was everywhere. There was a pile of unwashed dishes in the sink. But Brenda didn't dare to tell her husband that the apartment needed cleaning. He was already exhausted enough. Brenda herself continued to spend the whole day in bed. As the doctor had instructed, Jean turned out to be much older than Henry. She had a mature beauty, a natural grace that comes with age. A well-preserved woman. She looked about 50. She radiated confident calmness, looked directly at her interlocutor with open blue eyes. She spoke softly, firmly, and briefly. Jean combed her hair smoothly and gathered it into a bun at the back of her head, which suited her face. The woman looked rather old-fashioned, as if she had been pulled from another era. She wore long, modest dresses, didn't use cosmetics, and didn't watch television. She wasn't interested in world events. However, with Jean's arrival, the house shone with cleanliness again and tantalizing aromas wafted from the kitchen. And Brenda began to eat again, and then there was her signature tea. Jean made it from herbs and dried berries, brought in cotton pouches. Jean was very kind and sympathetic. She always smiled, but hardly talked to Brenda, limiting herself to topics of daily life and health. However, this even pleased the girl. She didn't want to talk to anyone, especially since she had nothing in common with Jean. Sometimes the woman talked about her hometown, about sunsets, the pure air, and subtly added that she missed her home very much. Brenda felt awkward about this. It turns out that because of her, Brenda, Henry had taken Jean out of her familiar world, and now this lovely woman was suffering in their apartment. Brenda sincerely hoped that the situation would normalize soon and Henry's sister would be able to go home. After several weeks, Brenda began to feel much better, having completed all the necessary tests, and she eagerly awaited the results. A couple of days later, the doctor confidently stated, Brenda, I'm glad that your condition has improved. However, the threat still remains. Do you mean I still need to stay in bed? Brenda asked disappointed. Perhaps the requirements are less strict now, but we're still keeping you on bed rest. And overall, you should go on a vacation to get some fresh air. To the countryside. The city's environment is definitely not doing you any favors. I've already told your husband about this. The doctor replied. Brenda was surprised that the gynecologist was in contact with Henry. That evening, she asked her beloved about it. Yes, I called her myself. Henry confirmed. I didn't want to bother you with questions, so I preferred to get the information firsthand. So, you don't trust me. Brenda pouted. Darling, I'm just used to controlling everything myself. You understand. Besides, all of this is for your well-being and for the health of our future child. The man replied, kissing Brenda on the nose. Henry, 
Maybe I should go back home. We have a country house. It's old, but... Brenda began to reason. What are you talking about? What house? Henry interrupted her. Who will be there with you? You heard about the bed rest. It hasn't been cancelled. Besides, Jean can't stay here for so long. Away from her home. Oh, by the way, I have an idea. Jean interjected. What if Brenda goes to my town? Pines town. Great idea. Henry immediately chimed in. The nature there can heal any ailment. Oh no. Pines town. From your stories, it sounds very far. Brenda objected. What's the problem with that? It's just for a short while. Henry insisted. We have relatives there. And the nature, the mountains, the river, the forest. And I'll come to visit whenever I can. Just imagine how healthy our child will be. Agree, my love. Over the next two days, all conversations revolved around this topic. Henry constructed his arguments so skillfully that Brenda realized she had no chance of defending her position. Besides, practically speaking, her future husband was right. What could be better in her situation? The noisy, dusty city or an ecologically clean town surrounded by mountain forests? Brenda agreed. Jean was pleased with her decision, and they began parking together. Henry also looked very enthusiastic. Brenda had mixed emotions. They had agreed in advance that her stay in Pines Town would not exceed a month. So why was she feeling anxious? Brenda couldn't find a rational explanation for this strange feeling, attributing it all to her unstable condition. The day before departure, Brenda overheard Henry whisper to Jean, everything is falling into place even better than we expected. She didn't attach much importance to this phrase at the time, but later she recalled it several times. Indeed, at that moment, Brenda could not even imagine how unpredictably events would unfold. The road to Pines Town seemed endless. For this mini journey, Henry borrowed a large jeep from a colleague. The back seats of this huge vehicle folded down completely, and he arranged a full bed with pillows and blankets for Brenda there. She was slightly surprised by this, as she thought the journey would take no more than three hours. However, during this short period of her life with Henry, she had grown accustomed to his tender care and attention. They set off early in the morning. Before the road, Jean brewed her magical tea for Brenda, which this time smelled simply divine. Notes of spicy Melissa intertwined with sweet flower aromas and fresh almond. Brenda drank the brew, settled comfortably on her improvised car bed, and almost immediately fell asleep. She woke up only when the car stopped. Henry turned off the engine and stepped out onto the street. Brenda rubbed her eyes, sat up, and looked out the window. Strangely enough, it was already night. Did we drive all day? Brenda asked Jean, who was sitting in the front seat and not moving. I'll tell you more. We haven't arrived yet. Our journey will take a few more hours. The woman replied calmly, not even turning her head to Brenda. I don't understand. You said Pines Town is 70 miles from the city. Brenda began to worry. I didn't say anything to you. And Henry may have his own perception of time and distance. Jean continued to speak evenly. At that moment, Henry got into the car and immediately smiled. Henry, what happened? When will we arrive already? Brenda asked irritably. Darling, the town is simply located on a peninsula. And the only way to get there from this shore is by water, on a peninsula. Are you kidding me? You said it was a you said Pines Town is 70 miles from the city. Away, Brenda protested. Sweetheart, you must have misunderstood me. The distance to Pines Town is just a little more. It's just that there's no proper road there. So while you were asleep, we were driving at a speed of 25 miles per hour. Afraid to disturb you so as not to bounce on bumps and part holes. Henry spoke in a calm, almost hypnotic voice. Brenda often found herself immersed in the sound of his words, which always calmed her. Only Henry knew how to talk like that. For Brenda, it became a real therapy. And now she felt how, under the influence of his voice, her whole body became heavy. She felt sleepy again. 
She didn't want to argue with her beloved anymore. Maybe it's the pure air. Her exhausted body, accustomed to city smog, clearly wasn't used to such an abundance of oxygen. And why did she suddenly start to argue? What difference does it make how many miles to this town if her husband is nearby, providing her with comfort and care? After a few minutes, a small boat appeared in the distance, swiftly approaching the shore. At the helm was a bearded man in his fifties, dressed in a linen suit. He shook hands with Henry and hugged Jean. Welcome back, sister, he said to her, then turned to Brenda, and a warm welcome to you, dear. I'm Randy. How many relatives does my husband have that I know nothing about? Brenda thought, watching the men load things from the car onto the boat. Jean carefully settled Brenda into a chair, covered her with a blanket, and asked several times how she was feeling and if she was feeling seasick. Brenda even regretted a bit that they were making this journey in the dark, as the landscapes around were breathtaking. The glossy surface of the river, framed by rocky mountains, myriad stars that are never visible in the metropolis, and centuries-old pine trees filling the air with a scent that made her head spin. Brenda was no longer angry that she wasn't warned about the actual distance to the town. People surely pay a lot of money to experience such conditions. And here she was, traveling for free, heading to her husband's hometown. Finally, they arrived in Pines Town. The sun was already rising behind the mountains, painting the sky in golden hues. The town was nestled in a valley amid stunning mountain beauty. Brenda looked around, her mouth agape with delight. She couldn't even imagine that such incredible landscapes existed. Brenda had only seen such places in photographs, in magazines. It turns out that much more beautiful places exist almost next to home. The town itself looked like it came from the pages of a glossy travel magazine. Neat, similar houses, gravel-covered roads, vast gardens, and a few strange buildings that looked slightly out of place in this paradise. There was no one on the streets yet. The early morning sun was shining through sleepy windows of the houses. How do people get around here? Brenda asked. Where do we really need to go? We use bicycles and horses. All transportation here is the most environmentally friendly, Jean replied. We have no more than 50 houses here. We like to walk to visit each other. Right now, Henry and Randy are going to fetch a cart to transport both you and the luggage. But are there any stores here? Pharmacies. The girl continued to inquire. Everything we need is regularly brought in from the mainland, but we're used to managing with our own products. Everyone raises livestock. Men go fishing and hunting. Women gather berries in the forest. That's why our food is all natural. The woman continued, then what do they sell in the stores? Salt, tea, various grains, just odds and ends. And you know, Brenda, when you get used to everything natural, you don't crave canned food or sugar. The body doesn't accept anything artificial or chemical. Jean explained, Brenda still couldn't grasp how one could live with natural farming in the 21st century. At the moment, she most wanted to eat an artificial chocolate bar with chemical souffle, and she happily remembered that she had packed a couple with her. What about medicine then? I understand there's no hospital here. Brenda asked again, realizing that this fact was extremely important in her current situation. As I said, one thing leads to another. We don't get sick here. If any illness suddenly appears, we treat it with herbs. We have our own doctors here. When the diet is natural and the air is clean, no illness sticks. We even make our own toothpaste, and cavities are not scary, Jean told her. Well, what about giving birth? I'll of course go back home. But, but there are those who give birth here, right? Or not? Brenda inquired. Jean looked at her intently, and there was condemnation in her guise. Even if you have to give birth here, we have midwives who will make it painless and without suffering. The woman assured her, but have only seen such things in movies. Henry, of course, told me something about this town, but I never even imagined that life here would be so unique. Brenda shrugged. Everything he seems like it's from another era. You can't even imagine, dear, 
How amazing this place is. Jean agreed. I'm sure you'll like it here. And you won't even want to leave. Brenda had no doubt that she would like Pines Town. Everything he seemed incredible to her. She had seen reports on TV about such places. Where people live like this. Isolated. Rejecting almost all the comforts of civilization. For those whose lives hadn't worked out in the familiar environment. Escaping to such a personal paradise could be a true blessing. However, Brenda couldn't imagine spending the rest of her life here. After all, her dreams and goals lay elsewhere. University education, an exciting job, and travels. Right now, she simply wanted to enjoy this amazing vacation. Reflecting on how many would pay a fortune to be here, she couldn't help but appreciate the opportunity. On the roofs of the houses, rows of solar panels were visible. As Jean explained, the town's residents didn't reject the conveniences of civilization that significantly eased their lives. So, everyone had refrigerators, irons, and other household appliances, without which life in Pines Town would be extremely challenging. However, there was no cell phone coverage here, which made Brenda somewhat uneasy. When anything could happen at any moment, she didn't yet understand how or where to seek help without a phone. Moreover, the accessibility of aid itself was questionable since reaching the nearest settlement wasn't simple. Strangely, any worries dissipated instantly here, as an atmosphere of tranquility and joy prevailed everywhere. Pines Town was waking up. People passed by, greeting each other with smiles. Perhaps Jean was right when she said that nobody he fell a law suffered. Henry's house turned out to be spacious and cozy. Immaculately clean inside. Make yourself at home, darling. Unpack your things and relax, he said, placing her bags by the door. Diane, Randy's wife, will come soon and prepare breakfast for us. And then, if you want, you can cook yourself. And who else lives in this house besides me? You still haven't told me who your relatives are here, Brenda asked. For a moment, Henry paused as if pondering his response. Well, how can I explain it to you, darling? He replied, not taking his eyes off her. I don't have relatives here, but everyone here is family, and you'll see that for yourself soon. So, Randy isn't your brother? Brenda wondered. Randy is my brother. Jean is my sister. They are more than family. Henry evasively replied. Brenda wanted to ask another question, but at that moment, there was a knock on the door, and a woman entered the house with a woven basket in her hands. She looked similar to Jean, wearing a similar long dress with her hair tied up. Brenda, darling, you are finally here. Henry has told me so much about you. We've been looking forward to your arrival. She said with a charming smile as she hugged Brenda. My name is Diane. I'll help you with everything so you feel at home. With these words, Diane took out fresh bread with a golden crust, homemade cheese, bright red tomatoes, and quail eggs from the basket. Everything's fresh, homemade, and the most delicious is the bread. Look at those tempting cracks on top, and inside it's so airy, she said, laying out the products on the table. Brenda, you tell me right away what you like to eat. We have chicken, fresh fish, cream all available, You'll try everything. Sister, you spoil us, Henry said warmly. How I've missed real food. Too bad I'll have to go back to the city for a while. For the greater good, brother, Diane replied, patting him on the shoulder. Brenda was terribly hungry. There was no trace of morning sickness. It was like magic. Everyone who said this place would cure her ailments was right. The food Diane brought turned out to be incredibly tasty. Brenda was even afraid of overeating out of habit. But stopping was difficult. Henry and Diane were having somewhat an interesting conversations at the table about the harvest, replacing solar panels, and Brenda hardly listened. She enjoyed her meal while trying to grasp a fort. It seemed like something they said struck her as odd, but she couldn't remember what exactly. Have to go to the city for a while. Brenda suddenly recalled Henry's words. That's exactly what he said. What could it mean? But why ponder when he's right in front of her? She could ask him directly. Henry, 
What did you mean when you said you need to return to the city for a while? Flashes of anxious thoughts appeared in Brenda's eyes. Henry and Diane exchanged glances. I don't remember saying anything like that. You must have misunderstood. Dear, he confidently replied. No, you literally said it not long ago. Brenda insisted. If only life were that simple. He chuckled in response. But overall, your thought is good. I'd gladly drop everything and stay here forever. In hindsight, Brenda replayed the events of that day many times. Every detail she saw, every word spoken. How did she not sense something was off? No. Over time, she began to understand many things. But on the day of her arrival in Pinestown, Brenda seemed to be in a dazed state. She was immersed in emotional bliss, seeing everything as colorful and beautiful oblivious to what lay beneath the surface. After breakfast, Henry began to prepare to go to the city. I have work tomorrow. Dear, it's not a short journey, so I'm hoping to get home by night. He explained his hurry. When will you be back, Henry? Brenda asked. I think in about 10 days. The man replied, keeping his attentive gaze on her. Once I sort things out with my graduate students, I'll come back. And maybe, if I can, I'll take some time off and stay longer, leaving. But my soul is torn apart. Don't worry. We'll help Brenda with everything. Both Jean, Randy, and I. Diane reassured him. Please bring me some chocolates. Brenda smiled. I understand I can't buy them here, but I'll definitely crave them. Despite the fact that the food here is really delicious. Of course, dear. Henry kissed her and headed for the exit. Well, I suggest you take a work. Diane looked at Brenda with a keen eye. You won't get lost here, of course, but I'll show you around the town. The women stepped out onto the street. In the daylight, Pine's town no longer seemed deserted. As noon approached, life was bustling. People worked in gardens. Some brought wood from the forest. And in the distance, a small herd of cows grazed in the meadow, tended by a cowboy on horseback. It was a typical rural life, filled with labor yet tranquil and understandable. People they encountered along the way greeted them warmly. All the women were dressed in the familiar long dresses Brenda had seen before. Over there is our store. Diane pointed to a small blue building, but it only operates in the first half of the day. Tomorrow you can go and see what they have. On the other side are warehouses for grain and vegetables. But we won't go there. There's nothing interesting. Diane continued. And this is the daycare. We have very few children. So there's only one group there. They approached a colorful house. In the yard of which stood bright swings. A slide. And colorful benches. There was no one on the playground. But from inside came the sound of children singing accompanied by a piano. I love playing. I graduated from a music school, Brenda said. But I haven't played for several months because the piano remained at my parents' house. I wonder if they let me play during off hours. I'm not sure. Diane quickly replied, taking Brenda by the elbow and leading her away from the daycare. And what about school? Do you have a school? Brenda asked after a brief silence. We do. Diane replied uncertainly waving her hand in an undefined direction. But it's under renovation right now. Let's go. I'll show you our central hall. Is this something like a rural club? Brenda smiled, but then noticed Diane pursing her lips in displeasure. They worked past a row of houses and onto another street leading to the eastern part of the town. A little further on a small hill stood a white brick building, topped with a right spire. It looked majestic yet alien as if a diamond tiara had been placed on a country girl's head. Now, that's beauty. Brenda's eyes widened. It looks like some Protestant church. What did you call it? The Central Hall. This is where we gather, our big family. And tonight, we invite you to join us. Our father, Jeremy, will be delivering his evening sermon. Diane replied, still unable to tear her admiring gaze away from the white building. At that moment, the pieces of the puzzle in Brenda's mind finally began to fit together. These long dresses, the brother-sister address, 
and now the peculiar looking temple. Pine's town was not just a town. Diane, pardon me for asking so directly, but is there some sort of sect here? Brenda inquired. What? Diane's eyes widened. I'm scared of those sects. They're dreadful. They take people's homes, rob families of their money. Okay, Brenda replied, slightly reassured. Then what do you call this community of yours? Everyone dressed alike, calling each other brother and sister, inviting me to a sermon. Well, first of all, it's not a sermon. And secondly, we're all just like-minded individuals here. People who've decided to live in a world of goodness and love. It sounded good. But Brenda couldn't shake the feeling that even Diane herself might be under someone's influence. Speaking rehearsed phrases, Brenda cited tiredness and wished to return home. Of course, dear, let's go. I'll walk you back. Diane obligingly replied, and they headed towards the house. Upon entering the house, Brenda was pleasantly surprised. There was a pot of soup on the stove, and on the table were porcelain bowls filled with hot bread, covered with a towel. Oh, Jean has already prepared everything, Diane said contentedly. So now we can have lunch and relax. Brenda took the large bright bedroom on the second floor of the house. The other room seemed empty to her. She forgot to ask if anyone else lived here. She was tired, longing to be alone and sincerely hoped that both Jean and Diane were only temporarily here and they lived elsewhere. Fortunately, Diane said it was time for her to leave after lunch. Their house was across the street, and Brenda could always turn to them if needed. But Jean lived right in this house and was supposed to return in the evening. Well, at least Brenda had got news to this silent and somewhat strange woman, Henry's sister who turned out not to be a sister at all. Brenda sat in the armchair, lost in thought. There really wasn't anything to worry about. People live as they please, not bothering anyone. She had never received so much warmth, care, and smiles directed at her, perhaps in her entire life. And as for their attire, well, that was their choice. What did she care about these women? She was just a guest here. Either way, it was an interesting experience that Brenda would surely remember later. Her musings were interrupted by Jean, who entered the room and handed her a bundle. It was a long grey dress, exactly like the ones worn by all the women in Pinestown. Here, take it, dear, it's for you. It's better to go to the central hall in it. The woman said kindly, oh, thank you, but I think I'll pass on going to your hall. Brenda replied apologetically. I prefer to go to bed early, but you can't not go. Jean responded with genuine surprise. It's your first day in Pinestown. We've all accepted you as one of our own. And even Jeremy himself knows you're here. Brenda felt uneasy. Just when she convinced herself that everything was fine and that what was happening here had nothing to do with her, they were already putting her in an old-fashioned dress and almost forcing her to listen to someone's speech. Yes. Indeed, they were compelling her, playing on her sense of guilt. Supposedly, we've opened our hearts to you, and it's difficult for you to come and listen to what our Jemmy will say. Brenda knew this psychological tactic well and now felt its effect on herself. All right, Jean, I'll go. Although such things are not my cup of tea at all, I'm very interested in it for educational purposes. Brenda lied hoping it wouldn't take too long. In reality, she felt constantly drowsy as soon as she arrived here. Wasn't she seeking such a peaceful rest on such a long journey? Brenda had only one question. Why didn't Henry tell her in advance that Pines Town was a place with certain peculiarities one needed to be prepared for? At the evening event in the Central Hall, it seemed like the entire town had gathered. All the women were wearing identical grey dresses with white lace colors. Exactly like the one Jean had brought Brenda today. The men were dressed in matching closed linen suits. Aha, you call it not a sect. Would ordinary like-minded people dress like this? Brenda pondered as she took a seat on one of the chairs by the aisle. The townsfolk hardly spoke to each other in anticipation of the beginning. Finally, the long-awaited speaker took the stage. Father Jeremy, as everyone called him,
turned out to be a middle-aged man of average height with an unremarkable appearance. He resembled more of a modest teacher than a leader whom a couple of hundred people hurried to listen to every evening. That's what Brenda thought until he began to speak. His captivating, deep voice with pleasant velvety tones mesmerized from the very first words. Brothers and sisters, I am glad to welcome you to our blessed home, where we are filled with enlightenment, goodness, and love every day. Jemmy greeted everyone. Today, Brenda has joined us. Let us all thank her for the long journey she has made to reach our land. He continued, and unexpectedly, everyone stood up and, turning to Brenda, started applauding. She certainly didn't expect that. She had hoped to quietly blend into the corner, out of politeness. We all believe that Brenda will be filled with the highest good that we create together every day. Jeremy continued once the applause died down. Several girls entered the hall carrying vessels of incense, and the air instantly filled with a heady aroma. Soft, monotonous music began to play. Jeremy continued to speak, but the meaning of his words was lost on Brenda. The familiar words formed into intricate verbal constructions that she could hardly repeat. It was beautiful but too complex to comprehend. However, Jeremy could probably speak in another language, and it wouldn't matter. The main factor was his voice, a voice that clearly had a hypnotic effect on everyone. Brenda glanced at the people around her. Some had their eyes closed, while others swayed slightly from side to side, with blissful smiles on their faces. Well, this is too much, she thought, even as she felt her thoughts dulling and a vacuum replacing them. Jean sat beside her, paying no attention to Brenda. She watched Jeremy submissively, hanging on to his every word. Apparently, she understood the meaning behind his words. The combination of sounds and scents made Brenda's head spin. Okay, I need to get out of here before I lose all understanding. A thought flashed in her mind. Brenda lightly touched Jean's arm. I think I'm having another bout of morning sickness. I'll go get some fresh air. She whispered to the woman. All right, dear. Do you need help? Jean asked, snapping back to awareness. No, no, please stay here. I'm afraid I might be sick. Brenda quickly said, heading for the exit, nodding to Jeremy on her way out. She felt like he never took his eyes off her, not even interrupting his speech. Out in the fresh air, she took a deep breath, immediately feeling the nausea subside. Of course, Brenda exaggerated the seriousness of her condition because she simply wanted to leave that place. Now let's recall our sociology course. She muttered irritably, quickly walking away from the white building. A totalitarian sect in its purest form. No matter how much they deny it. Wouldn't be surprised if soon they tell me Jeremy isn't just a father but a true god. Well, Henry, my dear. You'll hear a lot of good things when you come here. With all the townsfolk in the central hall, not a single house had lights on, making the town look ominous. Shivering, Brenda hurried towards her home, but suddenly noticed lights somewhere in the distance, which was strange. It meant that someone might have missed this sermon. Brenda turned off the main road to get closer. It turned out to be the daycare center. It was around 10 in the evening. The lights were on in the windows of the daycare, which seemed odd. It was only now that Brenda remembered there wasn't a single child in the hall, not even teenagers. So, parents leave their children at the daycare so late just to listen to the dubious speeches of some man. Oh Lord, did I stumble into something? The daycare gates were locked from the inside, but from the darkness outside, Brenda could clearly see what was happening inside and there was nothing happening. In the dimly lit room, about a dozen beds stood with children asleep on them. In one of the neighboring rooms, the light was brighter. Brenda observed a woman sitting at a table with a mug in her hand. More questions arose. Brenda tried to understand why the children were put to bed if the event would end soon and the parents would come for them. Intuitively, she understood that it was better not to ask Jean or Diane about it nor even mention that she approached the daycare. In this strange place, one had to find answers to such questions independently. Brenda glanced once again through the windows, hoping to see someone else inside, 
but the scene remained unchanged. She was already headed towards Jean's house when she suddenly noticed a female figure in a long dress standing by the pine tree, right next to the fence. In the darkness, the details were indistinguishable, but Brenda thought the stranger had long black hair. Gathering courage, she decided to approach closer. What could she fear in this abode of goodness and love? She took a few steps forward, but the girl moved away from the pine tree and fled. Damn it! Brenda exclaimed, borrowing her grandfather's favorite phrase, which he always emotionally uttered in the most incomprehensible situations. Perhaps that's enough for today. Enough sightseeing around Pines Town, and the tour guides leave much to be desired. The sights aren't impressive either. Brenda tried to joke to cheer herself up. Although subconsciously she knew her situation was dire. Waking up in the morning, she was relieved to find herself alone at home. Finally, she could sit quietly, think, make breakfast, and not interact with anyone. Yes, Brenda was very grateful to Jean for her help during this challenging period of her life. But at the moment, the presence of this woman burdened her. Moreover, Brenda was angry with Henry. He should have told her what Pine's Town was all about. She always respected others' beliefs, any associations of people based on ideological grounds. But Brenda herself never wanted to become part of them. She didn't even want to entertain the thought that it might be a cult or a club of grey clothing enthusiasts. The main thing was for them not to drag her into all of this. Brenda was terrified at the thought that even Henry might be involved in this society. But it simply couldn't be. Despite living together for only a few months, Henry was perfectly normal and didn't resemble the residents of Pines Town at all. Brenda counted the days until his arrival, eager to express everything she thought about him. And, of course, to leave here as soon as possible. Suddenly, she felt a strange sensation in her abdomen as if a kitten had brushed it with its soft paw. The baby was moving. Brenda had always believed that the first movement was unmistakable, and this was undoubtedly it. Brenda froze, trying not to breathe. She placed her hands on her stomach. The movement repeated more distinctly, and unexpectedly for herself, Brenda burst into tears. She should be home right now, sharing these emotions with Henry, calling her mom telling her everything, instead of being stuck in this godforsaken hole. To distract herself a little, Brenda decided to take a work and go to the store. There was nothing else to do here. Fortunately, Brenda brought along a few books. But that's all for later. Right now, she needed to get out of the house and breathe. During the day, Pines Town still looked beautiful. Strolling through it was a pleasure and Brenda decided to do it as often as possible while she was here. She found her way to the store immediately. Getting lost in this town was practically impossible. Hello, Brenda. The shopkeeper greeted her politely from the threshold, as if they were old acquaintances. My name is Teresa, and I'm both the owner and the seller here. I'm glad you came. Brenda didn't expect anything else from this paradise-like place whose residents had applauded her arrival just last night. Good morning, Teresa. Brenda smiled back at the hospitable hostess. Brenda, I'll tell you straight away. Our assortment is small. We only sell what everyone buys. If you need anything, just let us know. We'll order it from afar. The shopkeeper continued. Brenda thanked the woman thinking to herself that during the few days she planned to spend here, she probably wouldn't need anything. The assortment was typical for any rural store. The displayed goods were just nicely arranged. Toothbrushes, soap, towels, honey, rice, mustard. It was immediately evident which specific products were not produced or grown in Pines Town. Brenda didn't need anything from the offered assortment but at least now she knew what to expect. On one of the shelves, she noticed a glass bottle of orange juice. That was a joy. Now Brenda could make her favorite chicory, which she had thoughtfully brought with her. The juice was expensive, but there was nothing else to spend money on here. So Brenda reached for the bottle. Do you fancy some juice? Dear, Teresa asked her immediately. Rightly so. Vitamins are necessary in your condition. 
Just wait. I'll bring you a bottle from the stockroom. This one here is for display purposes. Teresa went through the only door, while Brenda touched her stomach, puzzled about how the shopkeeper noticed her pregnancy. After all, there was hardly anything noticeable about her clothing. At that moment, another customer entered the store, and Brenda startled, looking at her. It was the same stranger with the long braid that Brenda had seen last night. Perhaps she could have been mistaken, as it was dark near the daycare, but intuitively she felt it was the same girl. Brenda already smiled, expecting the visitor to greet her, as every Pines Town resident did. However, the stranger approached Brenda closely, leaned towards her ear, and whispered, run away from here. Before Brenda could react, the girl swiftly left the store. Things were taking a completely different turn. Just five minutes ago, Brenda saw nothing but positives in this small world. Everyone around seemed content and happy. What right did she have to criticize their way of life? But if there was at least one person who not only felt fear but also tried to warn a newcomer, then things weren't as perfect as they seemed. First, she needed to calm down and gather her thoughts. Brenda paid for the juice the shopkeeper brought her, kindly bid farewell, and returned home. There, she made herself chicory and settled into the armchair to think. There were too many unknowns in this equation. During her day here, Brenda learned only what she was told and shown, so the overall picture was clearly distorted. But as soon as she took a few independent steps, she immediately noticed some oddities. A daycare operating at night. A strange girl who initially hid in the darkness, but then found and warned her in the morning. Or maybe she was just some local lunatic. Otherwise, why wasn't she at the sermon with the rest of the town's folk? It seemed that to learn more, she needed to at least take a stroll through Pines Town and carefully observe everything herself. Before leaving home, Brenda even considered wearing that same grey dress to avoid attracting unnecessary attention. But then she decided that by now, every resident of the town knew her face. So, she opted for comfortable leggings that didn't constrict her stomach and a wool cardigan. She walked the streets, smiling at everyone, trying to maintain a composed demeanor. Some people she encountered along the way asked about her time in Pines Town, if she needed anything, and always ended the conversation with kind wishes. Brenda responded just as politely. There wasn't much to stroll around here. On one side, Pines Town was bordered by a river, and on the other, mountains and forests. Brenda suddenly thought that even if she wanted to leave here on her own, she didn't know how to do it. Of course, she could ask Randy to take her back on the boat from where they came and figure things out from there. But again, she needed to ask someone. She still needed to figure out what lay on the opposite side of the town. It was possible that there was a road through the forest leading to populated areas. That's the direction Brenda chose to go. She passed the neat rows of tidy houses, walked along the path towards the forest through small fields where corn and peas were already ripe. The girl couldn't resist and plucked a few tight green pods. Oh, how juicy, how sweet those peas were. Brenda picked a few more pods, put them in the pocket of her cardigan, and continued on her way. If there was a well-trodden path leading towards the forest, with clear tracks from carts, then there definitely was something further along. Gradually, the road began to deepen into the woods. The trees grew thicker, but Brenda felt no fear. If she looked back, Pine's town was still visible. It was fantastically picturesque, almost unreal. Everywhere there were bushes with wild strawberries. Brenda really wanted to eat those berries, but there was nothing to pick them with. So, she leaned towards one of the bushes and simply inhaled their indescribably sweet aroma. Brenda worked about 100 meters further and froze. Ahead was a tall fence made of barbed wire, stretching in both directions so that its edges were not visible through the trees. The path clearly led to some kind of gate and continued further on the other side of the fence. Brenda tugged at them, then noticed a huge lock at the bottom. She wanted to work along the fence, 
but she probably couldn't even take a few steps because it was surrounded by some prickly bushes. For a few minutes, Brenda stood at the gate, trying to see where the path led. Sweetie, are you lost? She heard a pleasant female voice behind her, and she jumped in surprise. Diane was standing on the path, in her usual grey dress with a basket in her hands. The woman smiled at Brenda. You scared me. Brenda replied with a trembling voice, trying to regain her composure. I was just walking in the woods and didn't expect anyone else to be here. Sorry, dear. I'm picking berries, and I see you're wandering around here too. Diane said, opening the basket full of berries and showing Brenda how beautiful. Brenda smiled, and not just beautiful. Brenda, they're also very tasty. I'm going to make aromatic jam out of them. Brenda had noticed before that Diane always talked about food with special enthusiasm, as if concentrating all her attention on these local delicacies. Indeed, Brenda immediately felt hungry and almost forgot why she was in this place. Diane, what's this fence for? Brenda asked with an unaffected expression. It's for wolves and bears. The woman replied immediately. Wild animals used to come to us all the time. They trampled the garden, ate the chickens. Thankfully, they didn't attack people. But then we all got together and built such a fence from shore to shore. It surrounds all of Pines Town. The governor helped us with that, by the way. I see. Brenda nodded. And where does that road lead? I don't know. Diane shrugged. Men go into the forest for firewood and hunting but I've never been there myself. By the way, it's good that I warned you. They turn on electricity along the fence at night. There are generators over there. Animals don't come here during the day, but they try at night. So, we had to use electricity to deter them. Understand, everything here is so logical. And there's an answer to every question, Brenda thought. No matter what, the important thing now is to stay sane. In this town, both options are possible. Either nothing terrible happens here, and I'm just imagining things, or something terrible is indeed happening, and then I need to be extremely cautious. Brenda pondered. She and Diane walked towards home, taking a different, shorter route. Everything was as usual. Kind, smiling people, busy with their daily routines. However, only now did Brenda realize that during her entire time in Pines Town, she hadn't met a single child, neither small nor teenage, that was clearly missing here. Running, noisy children, who are always visible in every town. Brenda decided not to ask Diane about it for now. Surely, she already had a prepared answer, and it's unlikely that this answer would turn out to be the truth. When Brenda returned home, there were two bowls on the table, one with peas, the other with forest berries. Apparently, Pines Town knew how to read her mind and give her what she had just been thinking about. Jean was cleaning, wiping the dust off the shelves. How was your work? Dear, she immediately smiled. I brought you something delicious and washed your dress. I noticed a stain on the hem. I was thinking, how would you go to the evening gathering in that? It's already dry. It will be like new by the evening. Brenda felt her vision darken. Jean, thank you, of course, but I, I'm not going to the gathering. I went yesterday out of politeness. It's just not my thing. Brenda replied confidently. What do you mean you are not going? The woman froze with a cloth in her hands, staring at her guest in surprise. Brenda, you can't miss the gathering. What do you mean I can't? You can do whatever you want, but it has nothing to do with me, said Brenda, and went to her room. All day she read, dozed, trying not to think about anything. She didn't feel like eating either. She decided that from tomorrow onwards, she would cook for herself and not overuse the hospitality of the so-called sisters. And now Brenda once again made herself her favorite chicory with orange juice and was about to return to her room when there was a knock on the door. She almost dropped her cup in surprise. Jeremy was standing in the doorway. Hello, Brenda. He addressed her as if he had known her for a long time. 
I was told you don't want to come to our gathering. Good evening, Jemmy. Yes, you know, I'm not feeling very well. She hesitated. But I was told that you're fine. You're just not entrusted. The man insisted, speaking with his deep magnetic voice. This news has upset me so much that I'm thinking of cancelling today's gathering. Why cancel? You're not arranging it for me. All the town's people gladly attend and listen to you. They're used to it. For them, it's a tradition. For many, a habit. But if I didn't even evoke a little interest from a newly arrived guest, then my work is meaningless. He spoke slowly, looking directly at Brenda, and she couldn't find anything to say. She didn't want to upset Jeremy, as he treated her with such respect that he even personally came to check on her. Well, okay, I'll just change and join you, Brenda replied, inwardly scolding herself for giving in so quickly. This time, listening to Jeremy was interesting. He spoke in a more understandable language, reasoning about the nature of goodness, which is not dependent on religion or nationality. And every word he uttered resonated with Brenda. She herself had long ago come to the conclusion that there are no good or bad peoples. Both scoundrels and the kindest people can profess any faith and live in any country. Kindness, it comes from within. This quality was the foundation of all the philosophy of Pinestown. During her entire stay here, no one said a single bad word to her. They only smiled and offered to do something for Brenda, essentially for a stranger to all of them. When else in her life had Brenda encountered such an attitude towards herself? Well, actually never. They were unlikely to be insincere. If you listen to the sermons of a person like Jeremy every day, you'll surely start to think like virtue itself. The scent and music that served as a background to his words no longer made her to see. However, at the end of the event, Brenda experienced a strange feeling. It seemed to her that she was watching herself from the side, and her soul was floating in the air. She didn't even remember how she got home and fell asleep, drifting into a deep, restful slumber. Several days passed. Every evening, Brenda went to the central hall, and with each time realized how much she enjoyed listening to Jeremy. She had never met such wise and profound people before. After each word, she felt an extraordinary peace inside. And then, lying in bed before falling asleep, she pondered what she had heard for a long time. They called him the father here for a reason. Brenda didn't have a real father, so she simply had nowhere else to draw from what Jeremy gave to people. Henry's arrival was less than a week away. Yes, Brenda still intended to express her grievances to him about not telling her anything about the peculiarities of Pine's town in advance. But she no longer felt angry. It was entirely possible that her husband knew in advance that sooner or later Brenda would like it here. Or perhaps he didn't see anything strange himself. But, in fact, there were no peculiarities to speak of. The more she listened to Jeremy, the deeper Brenda understood the meaning of how the people of Pine's town lived. They left anger, envy, and other vices outside their cozy little world. And even if it meant fencing themselves off with barbed wire, so be it. Brenda no longer wanted to ask any questions. Why disturb these wonderful people with her conjectures when they had been living like this for a long time? One morning, Brenda woke up to a pulling pain. She anxiously felt her lower abdomen, which felt like stone. Carefully getting out of bed, she discovered a small red spot on the sheets. Brenda had read enough about how miscarriage could start, so the most terrible thoughts immediately began to arise in her head. If minor pains were still permissible, bleeding could not mean anything good under any circumstances. She went downstairs. Fortunately, Jean was in the living room at that moment. Jean, I need to go home urgently. I have a problem. I need to see a doctor, Brenda said. Easy, easy, dear. Jean rushed to her, hugging her and guiding her to a chair. The woman immediately noticed the blood on Brenda's pajamas and, understandingly, looked her in the eyes. You know what this might mean, huh? Brenda moaned. Is there any way to call an ambulance? All right. You sit here and don't move. I'll go get help. 
Jean quickly replied and disappeared from the house. Minutes felt like an eternity. The ticking of the clocks hanging on the wall seemed unbearable to Brenda, as if someone were hammering her head. The pain was growing. All the objects in the room began to tremble and drift away somewhere far. Brenda woke up in a completely unfamiliar place. Diane, Jean, and several other unfamiliar people were crowded around the bed. Good morning, dear. Jean smiled, noticing that Brenda had opened her eyes. Everything's fine. We've helped you. Here, meet our doctor, Sister Victoria. She pointed to an elderly woman who was tinkering with something in a glass container, but immediately stopped and approached Brenda. You said you don't have a hospital. She said weakly, no hospital. But we have doctors. Victoria smiled, or rather healers. And what did you do? I clearly had a threat of miscarriage. Brenda asked. You don't have any threat anymore. Victoria reassured her. In the city, they would have filled you with hormones. But here we have miraculous natural therapy. We heal with herbs, hands, energy. Brenda looked at the woman skeptically, but noted that she indeed no longer felt any pain. She put her hands on her belly, felt the baby move, and breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you very much, Victoria. I do feel better. But still, I prefer to return to the city as soon as possible because I'm not sure if herbs can cure everything, Brenda insisted. You're wrong to think that way. Dear, Victoria objected. We ourselves don't get sick, and we've cured our brothers and sisters who came from the big land, even to middle cancer, diabetes, and other dreadful diseases. And Brenda understood that arguing with this woman was futile. She had nothing against natural therapy and even believed in its power. But right now she would feel much calmer to be in the gynecologist's office and have an ultrasound to make sure her baby was no longer in danger. Brenda decided to personally visit Randy and ask him to take her to the other side where she could already call Henry or an ambulance. Randy was chopping wood in the backyard of the house and didn't seem surprised when Brenda worked in. Randy, good day. I have a request for you. Could you take me to the other side today? Good day, darling. Why do you need to go to the other side? The man asked calmly, as if she were supposed to justify her departure. I need to go home. It's time to see a doctor, Brenda replied, feeling more and more irritated. And she was already tired of their addressing her as darling. As far as I know, you've just been to Victoria's. She's the best doctor, Randy said in the same steady tone. Listen, what does it matter where I've been? What's the problem? I'll cover your expenses. Just take me, Brenda insisted. No, darling, I can't take you. Randy said, and why not? You can't leave. It's not allowed. You, are you out of your mind? Who doesn't allow it? Brenda shouted. Darling, calm down. Diane's calm voice came from somewhere. Randy has his arrangements with Henry. He only meant that. Understand, your husband entrusted you to us, and we're responsible for you. How will we face him if you leave here alone, and something happens to you? For example, I'm not a little child to be responsible for. Understand, I'm an adult and almost a mother. And I decide for myself what to do. Brenda replied, that's right. That's why you always have so many conflicts on your big land. Diane continued calmly. You don't take responsibility for each other. You don't understand each other. I've heard that a person can lie unconscious on the sidewalk and everyone will just pass by, Brenda. And once again, Diane sounded convincing. After all, these people had just saved her. There was no more bleeding or pain, and she wouldn't have reached the hospital until the next day at best. And who knows what could have happened to her on the way. But then Randy uttered that phrase not aloud, and it undermined all of Diane's impeccable words. Brenda apologized once again, thanked them for their help, and headed home. After lunch, when Jean came by, she asked her to apologize to Jeremy and say that she was very sorry she would have to miss his sermon. But tonight she'd better stay in bed. Yes, that's a valid reason. Jean agreed, nodding. Even Victoria said that despite her treatment, 
it would be best for you to stay in bed tonight. Despite enjoying attending Jeremy's sermons, Brenda felt a clear sense of relief today. She didn't suspect how fateful her decision would turn out to be. The room slowly sank into cozy semi-darkness. Brenda suddenly realized that it was the first time she was in the house at this time because every evening she went to the central hall. She didn't want to turn on the light, so she decided to pull back the curtains to let in the last rays of the evening sun. She approached the window, glanced at the nearby houses with dark windows, which in the approaching twilight somehow looked lifeless. And suddenly Brenda noticed a female silhouette down below. It couldn't be at this time since everyone should be at the sermon. But a sudden intuition pierced her with hundreds of invisible needles. It was that same girl. Brenda had seen her several times in the central hall. But the stranger clearly avoided Brenda. But now she had come to Brenda's house. And it definitely wasn't just by chance. Brenda cracked open the window and whispered. Looking around as if someone else could be nearby. You're here for me. Aren't you? The brunette nodded and also glanced around. Come on. Brenda beckoned her with her hand. The girl quickly ran into the house. Brenda, please forgive me for appearing like this and probably scaring you. She apologized immediately. I can't talk to you. It could end badly. Oh my god. Please don't scare me. Brenda replied, her voice trembling. My name is Pamela. Promise me that no one will find out I was here. I slipped away from the central hall unnoticed, hoping no one will come looking for me. Okay, Pamela, sit down and tell me. I have a lot of questions, but first, I listen to you. Go on, tell me what's really going on here. Ha, huh. the wall clock struck eight in the evening. Pamela looked at them and began her story. It's not just a cult. It's much worse and larger in scale. Honestly, I don't even know what to call it. Essentially, they're building their own paradise here. Well, I've long since figured that out. And, to be honest, I don't see anything wrong with their endeavor, Brenda replied. Yes, it would all be fine if it weren't for the issue of children. Pines Town, a closed city, isn't aiming to recruit more members like other cults. As you can see, there's no room for more people here. Maybe they can squeeze in about 20 more houses, or clear the forest, Pamela explained. That's why their focus is on the children born here. They want to turn them into superhumans, devoid of any flaws. You see, you've seen the so-called daycare, right? What? What do you mean so-called? Brenda asked anxiously. Well, essentially, it's an orphanage called the Perfect Path. When a child is born, they're almost immediately taken there, Brenda, and the parents never see them again. I have a son there, he's almost two, and sometimes I'd write a peek through the windows to see him, and I'm not sure I'd even recognize him anymore, Pamela replied sadly. This just can't be, Brenda exclaimed. Are you saying none of the parents object to all of this? What are you talking about? Everyone just supports this philosophy, happily gives birth, and hands their child over to this perfect path. And from there, the child goes to a school beyond the fence. Do you remember working through the woods to get there? I was following you then, Brenda. I wanted to talk, but Diane beat me to it. I don't know how many people are in that school, but recently, Pines Town welcomed back a graduate, Carl. You might have even seen him. He's about your age. Well, I've never encountered people like him. He, Brenda, he, he resembles a robot, not a human. Believing all this was difficult. Well, actually, such information just didn't fit in head. How could something like this exist in the 21st century? Although there are different old believers settlements. There, too, people live completely differently. And their traditions can shock ordinary people. And here it's just special child rearing thanks to which the perfect person grows up. But if you are telling me all this now, then you must be against this system yourself, right? Brenda asked. That's their weak spot, Brenda. They don't welcome violent methods here, so not everyone can brainwash as quickly as needed, Pamela said. I got he two months before giving birth. 
I'm from a troubled family. My parents drank. I got pregnant by my boyfriend, and he disappeared right away. I begged on the streets for a few months, and that's when my Andrew picked me up. He's older than me, very smart, kind. He seemed like a real angel savior to me right away. Brenda, we got married. He waited for my child as his own. And then we came here with him, and I found out what awaited me. And you, Brenda, are facing the same thing. Brenda covered her face with her hands, unable to cope with the horror that engulfed her. And she had already begun to feel the atmosphere of Pinestown, no longer thinking about the things she didn't understand in it. What's more, she already loved Father Jeremy, finding in him her mentor and spiritual teacher, Pamela. But what? What should we do? Are you saying there's no way out of here? Brenda asked. She shook her head slowly. You can only leave here by water. On land, there's a fence with an electric current. You won't swim away. The river is mountainous. The water is icy even in summer. Yes, theoretically, you can reach the point where the fence meets the river. Swim a few meters and then work on foot. I even thought of doing that myself, but it won't work. They're watching you now, all of them. Many you don't even see, but every step you take, Brenda, is monitored, understand? They know perfectly well that you might want to leave. They're slowly preparing you. In a couple of months, there will be initiation into the sisterhood. And look, you've been here just over a week, and you're already caught up. Right, Brenda nodded resignedly. They bid farewell to Pamela, agreeing to communicate whenever possible. But such opportunities were scarce. It was dangerous to do so during the day, and it was simply impossible to talk amongst themselves during the sermons, while sneaking out unnoticed at night was out of the question. Brenda took works, went to the store for orange juice, and every evening attended the central hall. Although she no longer listened to Jeremy, instead lost in her own thoughts with closed eyes, it had only been two weeks since she arrived in Pines Town. But to Brenda, it felt like she had spent half her life here. So sluggish and frozen was time. Henry arrived on the weekend. Brenda awaited him even more, mentally preparing for a difficult conversation. Of course, she believed Pamela, but her mind refused to accept that her man was one of these people, because Brenda knew him completely differently. Although, according to her new friend Pamela, People like Henry belonged to the highest caste. They didn't necessarily have to stay in Pines Town all the time. They traveled to the mainland, did important things, and even worked like Henry. It was they who ensured the prosperity of Pines Town and its finances. Pamela couldn't explain what it meant, but she had accidentally heard such wording from her husband's conversation with Jeremy. Henry worked from the pier, carrying two huge suitcases in his hands. Randy followed him with some bags. Brenda didn't immediately understand why he had brought so many things with him. Henry entered the house, hugged Brenda tightly, and kissed her on the forehead. For a moment, it seemed to her that everything that had happened here over the last two weeks was some sort of dream, and now they would gather and finally return home to their little cozy apartment. Brenda, I have a surprise for you. Henry began immediately smiling at his wife. I've heard how good you're doing here. So I took leave from the university and decided that we'll live in Pines Town until you give birth. This was precisely what Brenda feared the most, but she never imagined that this event would happen so quickly. Pamela had said that Henry would want to move here closer to the baby's birth, but Brenda still hoped that it wouldn't happen. Henry, we need to talk, she said softly removing his hands from her neck. His expression instantly changed as if he had guessed what the conversation would be about. All right, I'm listening, he said, furrowing his brow in annoyance. Henry, I, I know everything about what's happening here and what you're doing with the children, she said. And what are we doing with the children? Providing them with conditions for a better life, he questioned, looking at Brenda quizzically. You, you, you're depriving them of contact with their parents, and that's already a crime. Brenda insisted. Sit down, Henry ordered, 
pointing to the couch. Brenda hadn't expected this tone from Henry, but she wasn't surprised by anything anymore. So, what do you want to accuse me of, dear? He began, of bringing you to the best place on earth, surrounded by the kindest and most caring people, a place where everyone looks out for each other. That's all true, of course, but that's just one side of the coin. When I wanted to leave this paradise of yours, I, I was forbidden. Why couldn't you tell me about all of its features beforehand? Ha, huh? Brenda asked, trying not to show Henry her fear. Well, telling you anything beforehand would be completely pointless. Dear, you need to get here to appreciate it. And you've already liked a lot of things. Admit it, maybe. But until I found out about the children, Brenda began to get nervous, and you should let go of your usual stereotypes. Just think about the world our children are growing up in. They see violence and debauchery. They're taught to handle weapons from infancy. They see naked people on screens and consider it normal. Yet they don't want to read. They don't see the point in education. And criminals and idlers can earn millions. Brenda, should I continue? Again, Brenda had nothing to retort. However much she prepared for this conversation, Henry was wiser and more experienced. In months of living with him, she had gotten used to listening and paying attention, always valuing his opinion. Arguing with Henry was impossible. He constructed conversations so skillfully, chose arguments so astutely, and always turned out to be right. Brenda only now noticed that Henry and Jeremy spoke in a similar manner as if hypnotizing with their sounds and intonations. It wasn't excluded that this was another reason why they were capable of leading people. They talked for another 15 minutes, and Brenda began to realize that she agreed with her husband on everything. She tried to muster the remnants of willpower and common sense to end this conversation. Today, Henry won, but that didn't mean she had given up. Several weeks had passed, Throughout this time, Brenda felt like the protagonist in a theatrical production. She forbade herself from thinking about the new reality as her permanent life. No, it was just a play. Because in reality, such things didn't happen. Brenda had discovered that Henry and a few other men were the main figures in Pines Town, closely associated with Jeremy. They were responsible for ensuring that all residents had everything they needed and for maintaining security. Brenda didn't understand the methods used to achieve this or where the money came from. But one thing was clear. Pines Town had established connections with the outside world and authorities. In the evenings, she and Henry would attend the Central Hall. Brenda noticed with what enthusiasm he listened to Jeremy. Several times she found herself close to Pamela, but they had no opportunity to talk, so they exchanged knowing glances. In recent days, both Henry and Jean had begun to talk more frequently about Brenda's initiation, after which she was supposed to become a completely different person. Brenda didn't even want to think about that day, let alone how it would affect her. Every day, she pretended that everything was fine and that this was exactly the life she had dreamed of. Meanwhile, Brenda observed. She was being watched, but she also watched everything happening around her, even though she didn't understand why. Sometimes during walks, she noticed motorboats passing by on the river in the distance. Theoretically, if she were on the shore at that moment and somehow signaled to the people on the boat, they could save her. But the chances were slim. It was simply impossible to predict the exact time when a boat would pass by. As Brenda made her way towards the shore, someone from the town's residence always seemed to be nearby. But how could she ask for help? Simply waving to passing boats wouldn't convey the urgency of her situation. Brenda speculated that some people brought supplies to the island, and perhaps she could ask them for assistance. However, she soon learned that several men from the town traveled to the mainland on motorboats to restock the store. So, she could only wait. Focusing on the health of her future child, Brenda wanted to believe that fate wouldn't separate her from her baby after all. One evening, about an hour before the assembly was scheduled to begin, Diane ran to their house screaming. It turned out Randy had fallen off the roof while fixing the solar panels and landed on rocks. Henry dashed to the neighbor's house, 
instructing his wife not to leave. But Brenda quietly followed him. Her large belly slowed her down, but she managed to reach Randy's house. A crowd had gathered outside, bringing stretchers to carry him. Randy lay with open eyes, quietly moaning but smiling, and even trying to hold Diane's hand. His head is intact. Victoria, who was bustling nearby with bandages, exclaimed loudly. Most likely, he has some severe bruises. Hang in there, brother. We'll fix this soon, okay? Let's be careful. Lift him and take him inside. Victoria, Henry commanded. The men lifted the stretcher and carried Randy up the street, with some people following them. Brenda breathed a sigh of relief, realizing that there was no tragedy and she could go home calmly. Suddenly, Pamela appeared next to her. Brenda, this is our chance, she whispered in her ear, taking her hand. Look what I found near Andy's house. Brenda lowered her gaze. Pamela held a bunch of keys in her open palm. These must have fallen out of his pocket. They probably have the keys to his boat. Let's go, Brenda, while everyone's busy with Randy. We won't get another opportunity. Brenda feverishly contemplated what to do. She understood that Pamela was right, but she was completely unprepared for an escape. Wait, I have nothing with me. Even if we get to the shore, then what? Brenda whispered in response. I have money hidden in my underwear, Brenda. I've been saving up for a few months. It's enough for a taxi to any city. And we'll figure it out from there. There was no time for deliberation. They had no more than half an hour to escape. Slowly, to avoid drawing attention, the women dispersed in different directions, pretending to head home. Once they turned onto another street, they quickened their pace and ran towards the dock. Brenda prayed to God for one thing only, that her child would be all right. They quickly found Randy's boat, unhooked it from the mooring post, and stepped onto the deck. And how are we going to drive this? Can you even operate a boat? Brenda asked as she watched Pamela nervously pick up the right key. How hard can it be? It's just a regular motorboat. I used to ride one at my ankles in the village. Pamela replied confidently. With these words, Pamela turned the ignition key and the engine roared to life. Great, exclaimed Brenda. However, Pamela suddenly froze. Look, you push this thing and steer with the wheel, just like driving a car at the amusement park. Even a child can do it. Pamela quickly explained as she seated her friend in the adjacent seat. Pamela, why are you explaining all this to me? Brenda puzzled. If you've driven this type of boat before, then you take the helm. Brenda, I can't go. I just can't. Brenda, forgive me. I offered this to you myself. I thought I could do it, but, but I can't. If I leave now, I'll never see my son again. Pamela whispered, wiping away tears. What are you talking about? Stop it. We'll go to the police together and we'll come back here not alone and you'll get your son back. No, Brenda, the police won't help here. You don't know everything. Run alone, Brenda. Here, take these, Pamela said. Pulling out some rolled up bills, she placed them in Brenda's hand, hugged her, then jumped back onto the ground. Her heart pounded furiously in her chest. Brenda understood there was no time to waste. She carefully started moving, gradually picking up speed and ignoring the cold splashes hitting her face. So, you're saying there's a closed community a hundred kilometers from here, where sectarians live, taking children from women. The young policeman said, eyeing Brenda suspiciously. Well, if you put it briefly, yes. She nodded. If you weren't pregnant, I'd think you took something illegal or watched too many detective shows before bed or something's wrong with your head. Sorry, the policeman replied, but it's easy to verify. I'm not sure if I can show the exact location. It took me about 40 minutes by motorboat until I saw lights of some village near the shore. And then I got to the town. The locals helped me. Brenda explained. Well, let's assume. The policeman sighed. The thing is, we're not on some fictional planet here. Understand? 
We know every settlement, every single one. You get it. I haven't heard of any Pines Town. Well, maybe that's its unofficial name. But, Brenda continued, but froze halfway as she met the policeman's cold stare. Miss, he interrupted her. I understand you. I'll take your statement and we'll definitely check everything ourselves. The policeman's words didn't inspire Rust, but Brenda could understand him. She wouldn't have believed such a story herself. She had to ensure her safety, so she wanted to involve the police further. But all that would come a little later because her mother and stepfather finally arrived. Susan could barely hold back tears, but fear for her daughter was evident in her eyes. Stephen, on the other hand, showed uncharacteristic sympathy. He asked Brenda to tell everything in detail. He silently listened and promised to look into it. For the next two weeks, Brenda stayed at her parents' house, venturing out only once to the hospital, accompanied by Stephen. She was afraid to go out alone. Henry haunted her around every corner. Brenda understood that this couldn't go on for long, but she didn't see a reasonable solution. Ignorance, deafening and paralyzing, was the worst of all. One evening, Stephen knocked on Brenda's door. Upon entering, he closed the door behind him, ensuring their conversation would remain private from their mother's ears. I have news, both good and bad, sighed Stephen. I've asked some acquaintances to look into this whole situation. Your Pines Town operates under the watchful eye of the authorities, Brenda. Some of these so-called brothers even work in the government. Officially, it's just an ordinary town. They don't bother anyone, you see. And, 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 what's the purpose of all this? Brenda looked up at her stepfather. He pondered for a moment. Power, manipulation, psychological experiments. Your Henry, with his PhD in psychology, doesn't he? Do you know what his dissertation was about? Of course, nodded Brenda. That's how our acquaintance began. Well, guess where he got his materials from? He's been guiding you from the start. He made sure you didn't get into university. He was in cahoots with your gynecologist. You were meant to join this society. Were those the bad news? Brenda asked, feeling a tug of apprehension in her chest. Not entirely. Stephen sighed heavily. A few days ago, a fire broke out in the temple where lectures were held, or whatever they call it. In short, in that building, Nobody can say for sure how it happened, but one fact emerged. Those who perished could have left the temple, but for some reason, they didn't. Your Henry was among them. Brenda didn't cry. For the first time in her life, she was overwhelmed by a myriad of emotions she couldn't untangle. Relief that she was no longer in danger. Grief for the loss of someone close to her. Gratitude toward Pamela for saving her unexplainable longing for the evenings when she listened to the sermon and horror at what her future life in Pines Town could have been. Years later, after obtaining a degree in psychology, Brenda was able to revisit the past. Now she understood why she fell so easily into Henry's traps. There was practically no information about the town. Stephen hinted once that all data on Pines Town was classified and it's possible that the remaining residents had long since left. Brenda often felt the urge to go there, but she knew for sure that it was absolutely forbidden. Pines Town often haunted her dreams, with plots that were bizarre and surreal. And when she woke up, she would spend some time trying to figure out if that town really existed or if it was all just a dream. However, besides memories, Brenda had long been in trouble by anything else. She was raising her 10-year-old daughter, Isabella, occasionally entertaining the advances of men, but her personal life never quite materialized, and she had no time for it anyway. Brenda put all her energy into her career. She had to raise her daughter, and only now, opening her own small office, Brenda felt confidence in the future. Her sessions were scheduled weeks in advance. She loved her work as a private psychologist, she could finally relax a bit. That is, until that strange patient named Keith Bears walked into her office. He dredged up terrifying ghosts from her past. 
and now he sat before her in a cafe, stirring his coffee with a large mug. Seemingly hesitant to start the conversation, thank you for agreeing to have coffee with me. I feel lonely in this town, especially with these panic attacks. Keith finally began, and thank you for the invitation. I rarely go anywhere. I'm always busy, you know, work. My daughter, Brenda smiled, you have a daughter. How old is she? The man noticeably perked up, which seemed odd, apparently. He wanted to impress Brenda by showing demonstrative interest in her child. Isabella will be 10 soon. Soon. When is that? Keith clarified, confirming Brenda's suspicions. Would an almost stranger be interested in another person's daughter's birthday for no reason? In April, Brenda looked at the man intently and quickly changed the subject. But Keith inexplicably became very animated after her answer. How do you like our town? Pleasant despite all the mines around here. But the city itself is convenient, straightforward for people. He replied, I agree with you. Honestly, I'm not a coffee lover, but I often come here, to the center, to these cozy cafes. I love sitting like this, looking out the window, at the river, Brenda replied. I don't particularly like coffee either, to be honest. I prefer chicory and orange juice. They don't make that in any cafe. Have you ever tried it? The man asked her with an imperturbable look, staring directly into Brenda's eyes. The woman felt a searing pain of memories piercing her entire body. Chicory and orange juice. There are no such coincidences. This man wasn't just throwing bait at her yesterday in the office. He was practically telling her straight out that he knew Brenda. She placed the cup on the table and asked in a firm tone, Who are you, Keith, and why did you come to me? The man lowered his gaze, shifting in his chair. I'm sorry, Brenda. I couldn't think of a more elegant way to check if it was you or not. He replied apologetically, Do you think I can read minds? Brenda was irritated. Your response provides zero information. What were you trying to check? Keith, I don't know myself. I'm behaving like a schoolboy, like a foolish schoolboy. His face noticeably saddened. He glanced at Brenda again. For many years, I've been looking for you, not even realizing who I was searching for. Are you mocking me? I ask you specific questions, and you respond with riddles. Checkery and orange juice was my favorite drink many years ago. It was during a period of my life that I've been trying to forget all these years. And now you show up and practically shoot me point blank. Brenda was speaking too loudly. Cafe patrons began to glance at her. Quieter, quieter. Wait, Keith whispered. It's a long story, and I'll tell you everything now. Brenda exhaled and fell silent, never taking her eyes off her strange new acquaintance. Anyway, a few years ago, the guys and I went hunting in the woods. He began his story. We flew there by helicopter, then walked several miles into the forest. I won't hide it. The hunt was illegal. Poaching, in other words. So, we went to the most remote places. And then suddenly, I see a woman walking. I thought it was a hallucination. Just imagine, for miles in all directions, it's a wild forest. And where could a woman come from? So this woman was all bruised hair disheveled, barefoot, and she had a child, a boy, about three years old. That woman's name was Pamela. Brenda listened, gripping the edge of the table. Tears welled up in her eyes. And what happened next? Brenda asked almost inaudibly. And then, my friends and I carried her to our camp. She was completely exhausted, light. So I carried her a couple of miles, and my buddy carried the child. While we were walking, Pamela told me where she was from and what happened. That she lived in some mysterious town. Her son was taken from her, but she stole him back and ran away. They were chasing her, caught her. But somehow, she managed to escape and talked about some fence with electricity and this chicory and orange juice. It all sounded like complete nonsense to me, so I wasn't really paying attention. But anyway, we brought her to the camp where the helicopter was, 
planning to take her to the hospital. Only we didn't make it. Brenda was no longer holding back her tears, paying no attention to other cafe patrons who were curiously watching them. What about the boy? She asked. I took him in. I'm sterile. Had an infection in childhood. And that was it. Because of that, my first wife left me when she realized we wouldn't have children. The guy said it was a gift from God for me. Initially, he was under guardianship, but I sorted out all the paperwork and adopted the boy. I named him Joseph after my father. I don't understand one thing. How did you find me? Brenda muttered in surprise. That, consider it Pamela's last wish. When we were flying in the helicopter, she was still conscious, saying something, but I couldn't quite make it out. One thing I understood, she was talking about her friend, who lived in the same town, was pregnant, and ran away a little earlier. Pamela asked to find you and say that your salvation was the best thing she did in her life. You have no idea how much you've stirred up in me. Brenda whispered. Now I'll probably need a specialist myself. Because, as I understand it, you don't have any panic attacks. And it was just an excuse to start a conversation with me. Right, if only you knew, Brenda, how many people I went through over these years, searching with private detectives for a young wife of a professor who gave birth 10 years ago in the spring. Many fit that description, Keith replied. And only then did I find out that Pamela's information wasn't entirely accurate. Your Henry wasn't exactly a professor, and all information about him was hidden and especially about his woman. That is, about you. There wasn't a word anywhere. Imagine, even at the department, no one knew he had a wife. I'm not surprised at all, said Brenda. You have no idea how grateful I am to you, despite the fact that you made me nervous. Over the years, I remembered Pamela, dreamed of meeting her, believed that she was doing well. Pamela did a great job. She didn't abandon her son. After all, it would have been much easier to just run away alone, Keith said. And now I have a son. Tell me, can I meet the boy? Don't even need to say anything to him. I just want to look at the child, the woman who once saved my life. Brenda asked cautiously, you know what? I'm a simple man, and I'll be honest with you, Keith said, smiling awkwardly. Brenda, I really like you. And I feel like all these years I wasn't just fulfilling Pamela's last request. I was specifically looking for you.